I guess we can wait for Barnum. <laughs> Good to see you. And Mark. All right, well, big crowd. Did this a couple years ago. There was a blizzard, and I think we had about 10. <laughs> So good turnout. We're going to have a, a little seminar on Social Security, understanding the basics of it. Um, my name is Ed Rondell. I'm the financial advisor at Woodwoods. <coughs> and one of the favorite things I do is to help people retire. The second favorite is to keep them retired. Um, and I get asked a lot, well, how much do I have to have saved, you know, to retire? And I said, well, I've read a lot of things. You tell me, does anybody want to take a guess how much money you got to have saved up to retire comfortably? Depends on what you want to do part of it. When I was at Merrill Lynch, I was told they had to have 20 times your ending salary saved for retirement. And I usually tell people, you got enough income set up where for the, to last you your entire retirement, you can really retire with zero dollars saved. Um, Social Security is meant to replace, they say, 40% of your retirement, so it's a very big part of your retirement. Um, I would like to introduce Matt Puka, who's a partner of mine through Bright House Financial. A uh, partner that I use a lot for my long-term investment products. And with that, I'm going to get this going because we need to be done in about an hour. If you have questions afterwards, we will be available. So thanks for coming. Ed, thank you. We will good evening, everyone. It's nice to say good evening at 5.45. So as much as it stinks we lost an hour of sleep, Saturday coming into Sunday, I think we, we all have a lot of gratitude for longer days here in this great state. My personal connection to Cloquet, I'm from Minnesota, I'm not from Cloquet, but my great uncle served as a pastor at uh, All Saints Luther on the street for about 30 years. Ed Morris, any, any members there over the years? Okay. Ed Morris? Yeah. Anyway, I thought I would share personal connection. I am thrilled to be with you all. If, if, if you're having walk out of this cafeteria knowing everything you need to know related to your own individual or household's decision on Social Security. But here's one objective we should have. If you don't have a foundation of knowledge, let's establish one. And if you already have some working knowledge on this very important topic, let's add to it. Now, as Ed mentioned, my name is Matt Buke, and I'm with Bright House Financial, which might be a newer name to say. If you know of MetLife, we spun off from MetLife almost three years ago, and I work through advisors. I like to start all of our conversations with a little bit of perspective. And my perspective this evening comes in this craft bag of jet puffed marshmallows. Now, more than half of you. Any students of psychology out there, whether it was in college or you just appreciate learning about psychology today? Okay, we got one, we got two, we got two. All right, I got two hands to go up. For those of you who are familiar with what was called the marshmallow experiment, at Stanford University, the late 1960s, early 1970s, there was a professor there by the name of Walter Michel. And this psychological study, like most, needs subjects or, 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 or folks to test it on. surveying children. And here's how the test works. Between the ages of three and a half and five and a half was given a marshmallow. And they could do anything they wanted with this marshmallow, including consuming it the moment it hits their paw. Now, I've got four kids who are eight and under. Only a small minority of the children ate it right away. But of those who attempted to wait, because the reward, again, if you waited 15 minutes, you got to see a marshmallow. Only about third of the children made it all the way there. Now some of you might be wondering, why do I bring this up? 
I bring this up because it is a parallel to what we see with Social Security and the desire to take the, the earliest eligible age, which is 62. Here's what we know. 50% of Americans file at that early eligible age of 62. And while you have access to your benefit at 62, it's important that if you trigger it early, you're going to have a reduction to the payment. And the reduction of that payment depends on how early you are to taking the benefit relative to your full retirement age. Just understand that if you take it at 62, you're probably anywhere from 25 to 30% lower. to advocate that you shouldn't take it at 62, because for some of you, it might make a ton of sense to. For some of you, it might make sense to wait, wait to the maximum age. But why I bring this up, because we know that if you're not taking it at 62, three in every four checks being received today by somebody in our country on Mexican benefits is reduced. Because if we trigger prior to our technical full retirement age, there's gonna be a reduction to the payment. Now I share this with you even more, because this is what we don't want. We don't want you to be in the 40% that filed early and then look back with a little bit of buyer's remorse. That's the last thing we want. The last thing we want is to wake up a year three years from now saying, I missed an opportunity. So that's where I applaud you for being here this evening so that you can educate yourself on the importance of what represents about 40% of the average monthly income for retiree. There are a variety of reasons why people choose to take it early. The biggest one is we don't know the benefits of waiting. And if you don't know the benefits prior to coming in, this component of my retirement income plan correspond and coordinate with the other buckets that I've been saving money into. Right? And then the fourth reason that we some people just need it. And if you need it and you don't have other earned income that will otherwise offset the benefit, then by all means you should take it. So we're going to start first with a couple of the basic terms and acronyms that you should all be familiarizing yourself with. And the first one is FRA. Anyone want to throw up a guess as to what FRA is short for? Full retirement age. It corresponds to the year you were born. So if you were born between 1943 in 1954, you have a full retirement age of 66. You can see for those born in 1960 to current, you have a full retirement age of 67. And it's really goofy. For everybody born in the years in between those two, it increases in increments of two months. So that's the first piece. And I saw the Captain Obvious saying this, but the year or the month you hit your full retirement age, you are eligible to receive 100% of your outlined benefit. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is what's called the PIA. Anybody want to throw a guess as to what PIA is short for? Social Security is a form of insurance. It's a pension-like payment. The administration uses PIA short for primary insurance amount. So those are the two things that go into your benefit. As we can see, real simple, your FRA corresponds to the year you were born. Let's go through a couple of quick examples. Let's pretend that you have a full retirement age of 66, and at 66, you would receive a monthly benefit of $1,500 per month. Now, if you chose to take it at 62, which again, you're eligible to do, you would have a 25% reduction in the payment. So instead of $1,500 per month, you'd be receiving $1,125. If your full retirement age is 67, say you're born in 1960 to current, you still have access at 62. But in this case, you're five years too early to the game. The reduction here is 30%. So instead of receiving $1,500 per month, you'd be getting $1,050. What's important for you all to understand is this is a permanent reduction. Unless we step into a spousal benefit or a survivor benefit down the road, the only benefit we're going to receive are the occasional cost of living adjustments the administration is going to make based on inflation. And in 2020, Social Security benefits increased by 1.6% this year from where they were a year ago. So 
so you'll still benefit from the occasional cost of adjustment. That's it. Now, as you can see, every year, actually every month you get closer to your full retirement age, your benefit's going to grow to what the outline benefit is of 100%. But as you can see on the screen, something happens up until age 70. Does anybody know the technical term for what administration calls that energy flow to your monthly benefit? It's considered a delayed retirement credit. So real simple. They're going to grow your benefit every year up to the max of 70 at 8% simple. So if you were supposed to have a full retirement age or a full retirement benefit at 66 and you waited until 70, you get four years of an 8% simple credit, your benefit is guaranteed to grow by 38%. If your full retirement age is 67 and you wait until 70 years at eight, that's a guaranteed increase of 24%. Now what happens after age 70? There's no longer any additional incentive. Okay. So unless you are charitably inclined, allowing the government just to keep your social security dollars. It doesn't make any sense to not file at age 70. But there's more to it than just waiting to get the delayed retirement credit. As far as eligibility goes, we have to have earned income to be eligible. And they measure eligibility based on quarters. Who can tell me how many quarters we need in order to be eligible to file for a benefit based on the work record of our own individual work history. 40. You need 40 credits to be eligible. Who knows how many credits I can earn in one year? I earn four credits in a year. Okay. $1,410 in recorded wages equals one credit. So you can make 15,000 in a year, or you can make 150,000 in a year. Both earners would only receive four credits that year. The good way there is you need 10 years of work history in order to be eligible.